Things are getting complicated, to put it gently, between longtime allies Israel and the United States. Yesterday, in a surprise to Israel, the Biden administration decided not to veto the U.N. ceasefire resolution between Hamas terrorists and Israel. That U.N. resolution passed in a 14 to 0 vote. Because of the Biden administration's decision, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu immediately canceled his delegation's visit to Washington, D.C., that was supposed to happen today. Yesterday, White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby spoke after Israel announced to the White House that they were not coming. We're kind of perplexed by this. Number one, it's a non-binding resolution, so there's no impact at all on Israel and Israel's ability to continue to go after Hamas. Um, number two, as I said in my opening statement, it does not represent a change at all in our policy. It's very consistent with everything that we've been saying we want to get done here. And we get to decide what our policy is. The prime minister's office seems to be indicating through public statements that we somehow changed here. We haven't. Nevertheless, today, Israel's Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, showed up for his meeting at the Pentagon with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. It was Minister Gallant's first trip to Washington in his current role as Israel's defense minister. The two nations' military leaders discussed many topics, including defeating Hamas terrorists, humanitarian aid, regional security, and a future maritime corridor in Gaza. Secretary Austin also stressed that no military activity should happen in Rafah without moral and strategic reasons. The safety of Palestinians in Rafah must also be assured. Earlier today, I spoke with member of the Israeli War Cabinet and former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer. Nice to talk to you again, sir. Good to be on your show, Greta. All right. Hania, the leader of Hamas in Qatar, he's been living like he's a billionaire, he's been living in luxury. He is right now in Tehran, meeting with the leaders of Tehran. They're celebrating this UN resolution and the resolution which says nothing about hostages. Um, your thoughts on this trip to Iran and why? Well, the, the resolution, just one correction, it does say something about hostages. It doesn't, it just doesn't link a ceasefire with a hostage deal. And that had been the American position uh, pretty much for the last uh, five and a half months, that any hostage deal uh, should be linked, uh, any ceasefire, I should say, should be linked to a hostage deal. And unfortunately, this latest resolution separated those two things. But you're quite right to point out to Hamas and Iran, because they both, they both uh, celebrated the resolution. And I think it's safe to say, Greta, that when Hamas and Iran celebrate and welcome a U.N. Security Council resolution, it's not a good resolution for Israel. And frankly, it's not a good resolution for the United States of America, because those are not your friends. Those are your enemies. What's your thought about why the Biden administration did that? Because it was always thought, when I said that it didn't have a, um, a provision in it for the hostages. My, my emphasis was on the fact that it didn't link it to, you know, a quid pro right. quo, that will have a ceasefire. That's what I meant. But why do you think the Biden administration um, didn't veto that resolution? I don't know. You're going to have to ask them. I was hoping that they would veto uh, that resolution. Uh, they had submitted a resolution, I think, four or five days earlier, which the Russians and Chinese vetoed, that actually drew that linkage. And here, they separated those two things. When I spoke to uh, a White House official on Sunday night and I learned for the first time about the language of the resolution, I said, that, you know, th this is a big mistake. It's a big mistake because you're delinking these two issues. And also the timing was very bad because we had people uh, in Qatar trying to negotiate a hostage deal. And the message that it sends to Hamas is, hey, you can get a ceasefire without doing a hostage deal, which is exactly what Hamas wanted from the start. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a change in uh, the U.S. Uh, position. They have said publicly that they haven't changed their policy. The problem, Greta, is that's not what the resolution states. So I hope they will go back to drawing this linkage in any text that will be brought forward at the U.N. Security Council, because without that, you're just sending a message to Hamas. Uh, ultimately, the entire world will turn on Israel and will force it into a ceasefire. But it, look, the, the situation is, is no one in the world is going to force us to a ceasefire. We are committed to well achieving victory. We've made that very clear. The prime minister has made it clear. We'd like to do this victory with America by our side. They've been there for five months. We think our victory is your victory. We think it's very important for U.S. interests in the region to stand with, with Israel until the end. But we have no choice. And if the U.S. decides to not back us now, we'll have to finish the job because we can't leave uh, the army, the terror army of Hamas with four battalions in Gaza. We can't, you know, finish 80 percent of the job 
leave 20% of the job. It's like somebody said, well, you don't get rid of 80% of the fire and leave 20% of the fire and then simply hope for the best. You've got to finish the job, and that's what Israel intends to do. Well, I must admit, I thought I was surprised it didn't have that linkage as well to the hostages, because that, of course, has been, you know, very important um, to Israel and to the rest of the world. And, you know, I was surprised that that language uh, was not, uh, not as heavily advocated by the United States. But let me turn now to the ground operation in Rafah, which is sort of part of this. I mean, I, I guess that the uh, Hamas and, and many wanted uh, wanted the ceasefire so that Israel wouldn't, wouldn't do this ground operation in Rafah. But now we've got the vice president of the United States saying it would be a mistake for the, for Israel to do this, which is just sort of another indication that is that the United States, at least the Biden administration, is pulling back from Israel. Well, look, uh, I understand that the vice president said it was a mistake. You know, on this issue, we just have a disagreement. We had a disagreement earlier on the war where uh, a lot of uh, administration officials, not all of them, but many of them said, look, it's a mistake to go in with any kind of big ground operation in Gaza, that it, you can do the job another way. I remember being in the war cabinet and asking the IDF chief of staff, I said, can we achieve our goal of dismantling Hamas's military capabilities without a ground operation in Gaza. And he said no. And I think the same thing is true. We cannot achieve our goal of dismantling Hamas's military machine and military capabilities without finishing the job in Rafah. We can't leave them there. There are 24 battalions. It's important for your viewers to understand Hamas in Gaza is not a terror organization. They're a terror army. And we are systematically dismantling this army. We have finished 18, 19 of the battalions. There are five left. Four of them are in Rafah maybe around 8,000 terrorists there, uh, and we have shown the ability to dismantle this, and we're going to do it. Now, once we finish Rafa, the heavy fighting of this war will be behind us. We are still operating in Gaza. We're operating in other parts of the Gaza Strip after we did the heavy fighting, but we do it with much smaller forces. I don't know if you've covered this, but in one of the most remarkable uh, anti-terror operations, Israel sent commandos into Shifa Hospital. Now, you remember that hospital in the northern part of the Gaza Strip? We had done a major military operation there a couple of months ago, and we warned people and we told them to get out, and a lot of people left, tens of thousands of people left that area, and then we worked on destroying the underground terror tunnel network there around Shifa Hospital, and we went into Shifa Hospital. But most of the terrorists had already left. When we came back now, after we had done those first big operations and we had destroyed a lot of that underground network, we caught them by surprise. And our commandos went in there, went in there into Shifa Hospital. And until now, we have killed 170 terrorists in Shifa Hospital. We have captured around 900 terrorists. We have had zero civilian casualties as of this minute when we're doing this interview, zero. And unfortunately, we lost two soldiers. And that shows the care that Israel takes in fighting. Unfortunately, you know, the world, when they see the issue of Israel going to hospital, don't say, well, this is outrageous that Hamas terrorists went back into a hospital and used it as a command center. Now we have gone in, but it shows what Israel is capable of doing with a much smaller force once the major military operations are behind us. If we don't finish the job in Rafah, it's going to be a very, very different story. So I'm quite confident that once we go into Rafah, within several weeks, the major military operations will be behind us, and then we will have effectively dismantled Hamas's army. That's not going to solve all the problems of Gaza. We have to have a conversation about the day after of who is going to replace Hamas, how we end its political rule. But you cannot leave that military organization uh, in place. And here, I must tell you, uh, Greta, of a conversation I had with a senior U.S. official a couple of months ago who came and said, you know, Hamas is an idea, and you can't destroy an idea. Uh, and I uh, replied, I said, listen, Nazism is an idea, and there are Nazis in Charlottesville with tiki torches that they got at Bed Bath & Beyond, but they don't control a state called Germany. And ISIS is an idea. And uh, there are people with black flags in the Middle East, in Europe, and even probably places in the United States who sympathize and follow ISIS. But they don't have a caliphate between Iraq and Syria. It's very different to have a terror organization, groups of terror cells, and they can do a lot of damage, as you saw in Moscow a few days ago with this ISIS, uh, ISIS uh, uh, network that they're part of. But it's very different to give terrorists a state <laughs> and to give terrorists the ability to build an army and then project their power. That's the most dangerous right. thing, and that's what our October 7th war is about, dismantling right. Hamas's terror me, army in Gaza. 
All right, so many of the people from northern Gaza have gone south where Rafa is. Then you've got now about 1.2 million people there. You've got a ground operation, and obviously you, you want to protect, protect the innocent. You want the terrorist Hamas. Is there any mechanism by which Egypt or anybody else is willing to sort of open? I mean, is that too simplistic? Because we've got to figure out what to do with the, with the innocent people as, as Israel carries out its mission, which, uh, you know, I, I've seen that video from October 7th. I understand, I understand that mission very well. Um, is there anything Egypt can do to sort of relieve the pressure there to help? Sure. If Egypt were to open its uh, gates and take in uh, refugees who were fleeing a zone of conflict, uh, there wouldn't be a single civilian casualty. Egypt had made a decision uh, not to take in these people from the beginning of the war. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but that's the decision that they made. I think it was very different than the neighboring uh, than the countries that surround Ukraine or Syria took during those wars. And it's, it's put the Palestinians, it's basically kept them in Gaza rather than having that outlet that have moved them to safety. And what Israel has done, given Egypt's refusal to allow anybody to come in, we have operated in the north, as you said. There were, when we did our operations in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, there were about 1.2 million, 1.3 million people in, and about 800, 900,000 people left that zone of conflict and they went south. Then we operated in Khan Yunis, which is sort of a little bit south of the center of the Gaza Strip. And there were 800,000 people there, and several hundred thousand went south. They went to Rafah. Right now, our estimate is that there's about a million people. Uh, there are different numbers there, 1.2, 1.5. Our people are telling us there's about a million people there. And we're going to have to send them north of Rafah. And I, there'll be plenty of space for them to go. It's, it's, it's our job to ensure that we can facilitate the provision of shelter and humanitarian assistance to them. Look, as you know, Greta, we don't want to harm a single uh, civilian in Gaza. And Israel has taken great care not to harm civilians. Uh, I think we've operated in a way that no other army has, because no other army has actually faced the threat of having this urban warfare with this underground terror tunnel network. John Spencer, who teaches at the Urban War Institute of West Point, which I think is a pretty serious place, said that Israel is going to unprecedented, doing unprecedented things to keep civilians of the enemy out of harm's way. And I think General Petraeus said something similar uh, when he recently came to Israel. So we have done everything to keep civilians out of harm's way. Hamas has done everything to keep them in harm's way. And when we operate in, in Rafah, we will give the people the chance, the opportunity to leave. Our past rounds, both in the northern part of the Gaza Strip and Khan Yunus, when we went in with a big military operation, people left that zone of conflict. I'm confident that they're going to do it now. And our military is finalizing. a humanitarian assistance plan to make sure that when they go uh, north of Rafah, there is going to be a place for them to get this uh, badly needed humanitarian assistance, which Israel is facilitating. And I hope one thing that you will push back on, uh, because a lot of others are not pushing back, is the idea that Israel has some sort of policy of trying to starve the population in Gaza, which is, I think, a, a, a completely absurd. Uh, and we don't have such a policy the opposite policy. We have the policy of getting as much food as possible into Gaza. It's been very difficult because of Hamas inside Gaza, stealing it, taking over the humanitarian assistance. But our policy is to allow for the basic humanitarian needs of the population of Gaza because they're not the ones we're fighting. We're fighting the Hamas terrorists.